Joe, welcome to Dubai. Well, it's a pleasure. It's fantastic. It's the first time we've been here. We've been meeting everybody, and as, as far as networking is concerned, it's absolutely incredible. Mm. So, so, so Joe Foster, the founder of Reebok, the shoemaker, is um, <clears throat> is available now. So much I didn't know about your story. Right. And 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 so everything was almost a revelation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really was. I mean, I knew so little about the brand, if I'm being uh, absolutely honest. And and everything's in there now in black and white. Um, but from 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 selling the company, then performing a bit of a sort of temporary founder's role to when you actually retired. Yeah. So then, you know, that was, let's say, 89. And then you didn't probably start writing the book until 2015, 2016, or the, the spark of you know, the idea came about. Yeah, around I would say probably about 2014. 2014. Because, uh, we, were, we were in Tenerife and I was enjoying life. But uh, you know, we were picking up on Wikipedia and Google and, oh, you know, you pick up, you look at Reebok and, there's, uh, this is how Reebok started. There about three or four different stories on how Reebok started, where he came from. You know, they were wrong. And then there's a photograph. Joseph William Foster, uh, founder of Reebok. Who? No idea. So the photo was. wasn't you? No. Yeah. On, on Wikipedia? No, on Wikipedia, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was saying, um, many people have said, why don't you write your story? Do you know? well, I don't need to really, but... Uh, I mean, then I thought, well, <clears throat> we've got to put this straight. Yeah, we, we've got to get this right. So I started and sat down. And once you start, sort of, once I started, maybe not for everybody, but things come back. And I think the biggest problem was uh, chronology, to get everything in the right order. The small beginnings when Mr. J.W. Foster in 1895, here in Bolton, made his first pair of running shoes. That's what I think is so great about the book is don't forget the trade and the craft that, that, that got this to where it, where it is. Yeah. You know, what every single, you were involved in every single, pretty much every element of, of this of this shoe. So talk, talk us back to... Um, Just the funny sorry. thing, talking about that shoe. I designed that sole yeah. in 1970, about 1977. And it, they've changed it a little bit. They've made a few on bits and pieces because we didn't have enough money to make a foam mold that size. We had to split it in two. So I had three molds for the heel, three molds for the uh, sole, the front sole. And then we just cut it down with a knife. We just chopped it down so we could cover about 10 or 12 sizes. But you know, I mean, I was born in 35, and by 39 we had World War II. So I was only four years old. So. Was your grandfather making run athletic shoes, or was it? Was he just? He was obviously a cobbler, but was he working way, making normal shoes, or was it always athletic shoes? As far as the manufacturing was concerned, it was always athletic shoes, because I, I think he had really little choice. Because he was a cobbler, and so he repaired. Our grandfather was a bit sort of innovative and thought he would have a go at this. It seemed like a good idea, so he made himself a pair of shoes. You know, he had to learn this. He didn't go to college. You know, there was no no one said this is how you make shoes. You know, he was a cobbler, and so he sort of converted from being a cobbler to a shoemaker. And there's a big difference, you know, one's just repairing the sole, usually maybe stitching a bit of the upper if it's gone. But he had to design his shoe and, uh, and make them. <clears throat> and okay, uh, the biggest problem was that uh, he died in 1933, 1933, I wasn't born until 1935. And it, it makes a good story because I was born on his birthday. So he developed this nice running company. And from there on, even though it was small, he delivered shoes all over the world. It was only when we, we got Reebok going, we started Reebok, we left the Foster uh, family, we started our own company. And it was, we were probably about five or six years in, and we sort of were building nicely. And we started investigating, we started digging deep into, you know, what did grandfather do? How did he do it? And we learned an awful lot. Uh, and yeah, he did it with advertising in local newspapers. It's incredible, some of the adverts that, uh, that he put in there, like, uh, if you don't believe that Foster's are the best running shoes you've ever worn, we'll give you £100. <laughs> you and your brother uh, decided that, you know, uh, you had a different path to take and a different vision and a different journey to go. So you left the family business, Foster's, yes. and then set up your own. So what, yes. what, what was that called? When you well, we started up? off as Mercury Sports Footwear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, is, it is a story in itself, of course. I think and the my, name was challenged, wasn't it? The, the trademark was challenged. No, perhaps, no it wasn't challenged. Um, it was our, our accountant who said, uh, you know, we're doing nicely. We were making some money. 
And he said, you know, you, you better register that name. I said, how do you do that? He said, well, go and see a patent agent. And the patent agent was in Manchester and uh, he'll do it for you. So I went to see him and gave him, you know, Wayne Mercury or whatever. And he came back about a week later and said, uh, sorry, uh, it's pre-registered. This is already part of Lotus and Delta, well, part of British Shoe Corporation. Who we yeah. from Leeds. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But uh, they're not using it. Oh, right. So, so it's a dorm, it was a dormant brand. Yeah. So we can use it. Yeah. He said, but yeah, but they're pre registered. So they've offered it to you for a thousand pounds. Now, at that time, we just set up a whole factory for 250 pounds. <laughs> thousand pounds 250 pounds to yeah. set up a factory yeah. just to put in, in perspective <laughs> absolutely so the patent team said well if you uh, if you can't buy it you've got to bring me another name i've got to take you back to 1943 i'm eight years old and uh, and we had a local running event at Leverum park and uh, i won a 60 yard race but i did have an advantage i had foster spikes and in those days, use the family athletic shoes with the spikes in the bottom. Yeah. Your grandfather had kind of That's designed right. it. Yeah. yeah, I had those spikes, and I don't think anybody else had even seen spikes. Never mind, uh, I had a pair of spikes. So I won the race, uh, and I went up to collect my prize. And my prize was a dictionary. <laughs> you know, and I'm, you know, where's the football guys? <laughs> Kid, you know, what do I do with the dictionary? Or the medal or the gold cup or yeah, something. Give me something, but no, a dictionary. And the thing is that it was an American dictionary, a Webster's dictionary, mm -hmm. Webster's. And of course, if I had used that at school, I'd have had a lot of spellings totally different, mm -hmm. but I didn't. But I, I won this but dictionary. But you kept it? I had kept okay. it, yes. And where we sit at the table and my dictionary is there. And I'm uh, thinking, I like the letter R. I don't know why. It's one of those things. I like R. Okay, so I get my dictionary. I open it up with R. And I start thumbing through. And it's not long, really, here to enter R E. It's fairly early down mm -hmm. there, yeah. R W -E B O K. What's that? And it's a small South African gazelle. Gazelle. We're a running company. Mm -hmm. Gazelle. That's it. Light bulb moment for yourself here. A Reebok is a small antelope that has survived very well in spite of the predators and unforgiving terrain of its home on the plains of Central Africa. Straight to the top of the list, I go back to the patent agent with my list of 10. I say, look, I've given you 10 names, but that's the one we want. So we got the name. The, uh, the registrar, though, he made one caveat. And that was that uh, if somebody comes to you and they're making uh, shoes out of Reebok skin, you can't stop them. That's out of Reebok skin. And Jeff and I and Uncle Jeff and I said, nah, that's never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Out of this world, that won't happen. And it didn't. But, uh, so, but the register said, because of that, we're going to put you in part B of the register. Part B? Mm -hmm. There's a register, there's a register. Mm -hmm. Part B, okay. 20 years after, 20 years later, he came back to us. The registrar came back to so us. We moved it to part A of the register. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, he said, everybody now knows that Reebok is a sports shoe. It's not an animal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about some of the elements of the shoe, the original DNA of the, the, the brand DNA, like the, the Starcrest, the, the, the Union Jack. So f first of all, I, I know you've got a great story about the window here and how, how the yes. window came up, because this is now a, a, a design classic. I mean, it's, this it is. is yeah. yeah, I mean, other brands have copied it, I've seen, but, uh, but this is, this is, it's very split. I mean, this is, this had never been done before. So the no. window concept with the brand. So tell us about how the, the, the window uh, idea came about. This design, the, uh, uh, we call it the Vector. I used to call it the Arrow. And it really came from, we had to change. The reason we had to change is that four years into our business, we get a letter from Adidas. Because um, we had two stripes and a T-bar. And uh, they saw that two, bar, two stripes and a T-bar, it infringed their three stripes. So please desist that immediately. And I think five minutes it took us to say, oh my God, what was that about? I mean, just a minute, I did us know we're here. Wow, you know, they don't say they're worried about us, we're but the, we're on the map. Find, yeah. yeah, they find it necessary to write, and you know, we're infringing their trademark. <clears throat> we're on the map. So that, that letter was stuck to the wall for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing very nicely. But Paul saying, uh, you know, Joe, he said, I, I really do like that uh, road, the, you know, Starcrest. He said, but. 
know, it looks a bit like the Union Jack. I said, yeah, it has a bit of similar look, you know, but uh, so why, why don't we use the Union Jack? He said, why, Paul? He said, well, you know, he said, everybody in America knows the Union Jack. And I thought that everybody in America knows the Union Jack. Thought, Fantastic. He said, Paul said it costs us millions to get everybody to recognize the star crest. Right, I see, I see. But the Union Jack is instantly recognizable. Knows. So I said, yeah, well, what are you okay for? I said, we can probably do that. I said, they'll probably kill us in the UK <laughs> because, you know, you put the Union Jack on and people expect you to uh, sort of make the stuff. They should be made, yeah. But, yeah. Like, but not only did we put it on the shoes on each side, we also put it on the lid of the box. Mm. So, so this character Arnold is, is amazing. I mean, if you can, you mention him in the book, but he identified this gap in the market. Yes. Um, what, what I love about that is that the fact that women were the driving force behind this major yes. change in, in the company direction. Yeah. Totally I mean, unbeknown to you. Yeah, I mean, oh, totally unbeknown to me, yes. But Arnold's uh, feeling on this was, we'll make this for aerobics. And aerobics is for women, really, it's not for men. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, they did eventually get And it was, it was a male-dominated industry, I guess, the well, manufacturing, sport, is, sport, yeah. sport, sport, sport was. And, yeah. and, and then, you know, here's this character who identifies this this gap in the market, you know, uniquely for women. Uniquely and empowering, for women. empowering women yeah. and giving them some a product for, for something that's uniquely theirs. And they've invented, they've created, they've created this community, yeah. which is amazing that, that that caused the whole shift in, 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 yeah. in, in, in the company's business. Well, that was a big, that, success. That was a big secret of the whole thing because not only was he sort of saying, you know, let's make this just for women, we'll make it on a woman's last. So the last itself was much narrower and really a man couldn't put his foot in that. This was just made for women and they only made it women's sizes. The, the brilliant thing about uh, aerobics though, is that yes, we were a $9 million company in, in the running market and growing, but you know, we weren't known. We were only known to a running community. Uh, aerobics took a street, took us onto the street. Aerobics took us onto the street. And uh, we became known as a woman's company because we were not, we were not known like Nike, Adidas, male, sweaty, as you alluded to it, you know, mm -hmm. they were male and sweaty. So it was a bit of a sort of a jump for uh, Nike or Adidas to sort of just to go to women when all of a sudden they had women had Reebok mm -hmm. with this nice all white shoe, with Reebok on the side, a little Union Jacket yeah. color. So, uh, yeah, I mean, marketing wise, it was absolute genius. And, you know, Jane Fonda went out and bought a pair of shoes to use in her videos that she was on these yeah. training videos, uh, fitness videos. And of course, you're only seeing sales. Go this, just, that, right? this just went absolutely wild. When this started, we were a $9 million company, which, you know, $9 million, uh, not bad, nice company, but not going anywhere much. And uh, the year after, we were a $30 million company. The year after that, a $90 million company. Then we went up to $300 million and then $900 million. We were just short of a billion. In, I think it was between four and five years, the growth. We went up to a billion. I mean, it was really keeping up with the business. That yeah. was the problem. It was, it was growing so fast that yeah. trying to keep up with the demand yeah. Yeah. was incredible. And uh, yeah, it, it seemed to, in the sort of mid to late 90s, it seemed to sort of flatten, become sort of you know, a plateau. It, didn't, it stopped growing. Mm -hmm. And I think possibly that was because uh, the company had grown so fast, the people coming into it were really people servicing the demand as against creating the demand. Rather than disrupting and create, looking yeah. for new opportunities That's like, right. uh, like uh, Arnhel did. Uh, yeah. So it's very tough, I think, for anybody to run a company mm -hmm. and keep that right image, keep it going right. It very is difficult. And uh, um, I think you've got to keep changing it to keep that spirit. Are you finding it rewarding, like celebrating? And is it kind of, is it almost like bringing back memories that you, it, if things were moving too fast at the time, but now you can sit back and talk about them, you're able to relive them and enjoy them and cherish those moments, I guess. Well, I, I guess I can do it. It's also, uh, I'm learning a lot. Mm. I'm learning about myself. You just do things because you need to do things. I think if you're an entrepreneur, you need to do that and to get on with it and not worry too much about it, overthink it. He's following the gut feeling at the yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and now that uh, we're counting the story and people ask the questions, you think, oh yeah, yeah, it was pretty unique. We did, we did pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wasn't too bad, you know. And, and I enjoyed it. Yeah. That's the main thing. You have to, you have to enjoy. It. You have to have that passion because that really is uh, 
That's, that's what entrepreneurs do. They, they do something that they like. And uh, the only way to make it win, really, is to enjoy it. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you're not enjoying it, I don't see how anybody can stay with it. What a great way to, uh, to wrap it up and, and celebrate an amazing career and a, an amazing company that you built, brand achievement, and, and now, more importantly, the book, you know, where the, the facts are here in black and white. They are yeah. indeed, and, yes. Um, congratulations on everything. Congratulations on getting the book out, and it's been wonderful to meet you, and uh, hopefully we can do it again. It's a great experience. Thank you, Joe. Fantastic. Thank you.